Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Terrence Henry, and I am Executive Director of TAMIST, the Academy of Medicine, Engineering, and Science of Texas. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're excited to uh, bring everyone together to take a look at COVID-19. And uh, this is an ongoing series that our uh, academy is hosting in Texas to uh, share the science and the latest research on the pandemic. And today's session will focus on treatment and vaccine development. Uh, before we get started, I'd just like to say a couple uh, of words about TAMIST and who we are as an organization. We were co-founded in 2004 by Senator K. Bailey Hutchison and a couple of Nobel laureates, Michael Brown and Richard Smalley. And uh, we are a convening uh, research organization in Texas that brings together the scientific community across the state from various disciplines and different institutions. We are composed of any Texas-based members of the National Academies of Medicine, National Academy of Sciences, or National Academy of Engineering, as well as the Royal Society and the state's Nobel laureates. Our mission is to bring together the state's brightest minds in medicine, engineering, science, and technology to foster collaboration, advance research, innovation, and business in Texas. Uh, I'd like to take a moment to thank our uh, academic member institutions, which uh, make our work possible, uh, including uh, four of which today are represented by our speakers and moderator. Uh, very grateful for your support. Uh, so this series is called Forward Texas. It's about taking a look ahead uh, at what the science can tell us today about where things are going with this COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so we're gonna have about the first half of the session will be devoted to presentations from our speakers and the second half will be devoted to audience Q&A. Uh, some of you have submitted questions in advance, so thank you for that. If you have questions for our speakers that come up during the session that you'd like us to address in that Q&A portion, uh, please use the Q&A function in Zoom, uh, and you can just type your question in there. I'd now like to introduce our moderator, TAMIS member Florence P. Hasseltine. She is a member of the National Academy of Medicine and the Presidential Distinguished Professor at the University of Texas at Arlington. Dr. Hasseltine, thank you for moderating today's session, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Henry. Um, this is exciting to me because my scientific and public policy career have always focused on women's health and the expression of sex differences in the way disease um, is presented. Late in my career, I added IT to help nonprofit groups such as the Global Virus Network develop their databases. So this experience clearly has relevance during this COVID pandemic. The overall goal of this session is to provide a scientific perspective on the development of possible treatments and vaccine for COVID-19. First, we'll hear from Dr. Batazzi, Associate Dean at the National School of Tropical Medicine at Baylor uh, College of Medicine, who will present on vaccine development. Our second will be Dr. Jan Professor of Internal Medicine at the UT Southwestern Medical Center, who will present on clinical trials of COVID-19 treatments at her institution. And our final speaker will be Dr. Weaver, the John Seeley Distinguished Chair in Human Infections and Immunology, Immunity, um, and the University of Texas Medical Branch, who will present on the development of both treatments and vaccines at UTMB. Each speaker will have seven minutes for the presentation. At the end of their presentation, we will have a Q&A with the speakers. So please submit your questions using the Q&A window in Zoom. Dr. Batazzi, we will start with your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hasseltine. Thank you so much, Terrence and uh, Tamist for the invitation. A pleasure to be with uh, uh, Dr. Weaver as well as Dr. John. Um, so I am going to give you a little bit of a landscape of the um, uh, vaccine development efforts that are not only occurring in the United States but also in uh, the rest of the world. 
Uh, I um, work at Baylor College of Medicine. I, together with Dr. Peter Hotes, we lead the National School of Tropical Medicine, as well as a section in Pediatric Tropical Medicine, but uh, more appropriately for this topic, uh, for the last 20 years, we have been uh, co-directing a, a very unique um, center for vaccine development, primarily focusing on developing vaccines for neglected uh, and emerging infections with the objective, of course, to uh, bringing them uh, to the global uh, communities as, uh, of course, uh, safe, uh, effective, and, and affordable vaccines. Um, if I can have the next slide. Uh, thank you. So uh, I, there are many, many trackers that you potentially can uh, look at. Uh, in fact, yesterday there was a New York uh, Times article that gave some uh, really good uh, indication of where are we at with vaccines development. Um, I like to focus on the uh, Milken uh, Institute tracker. Uh, based on what I saw yesterday, as you can see, uh, combined between uh, not only treatments that are on, in consideration, but as you can see, there's a lot of vaccines, a lot of vaccine programs and groups that are attempting to develop uh, a vaccine that, that is going to be safe and effective against COVID-19. Um, just to highlight, uh, it's, it, it's important to note that uh, many of these vaccine endeavors are um, utilizing platforms uh, that you know, uh, in, in great majority are also considered um, uh, experimental platforms, meaning that they uh, are not necessarily the basis for prior licensed vaccines. Only a few of these platforms that you see in the box, uh, such as, for example, of course, live attenuated uh, or inactivated viruses or even recombinant protein vaccines, those we know that we, of course, have used many, many times in other vaccines. Some of the newest technologies, including DNA, RNA, you have to keep in mind that they're experimentals also as a technology or a platform. Uh, and so again, we have to be mindful of uh, uh, the proprietary um, components of these, also whether they need to be packaged or formulated with uh, also um, a proprietary or also experimental adjuvants. So the bottom line is that sometimes uh, we also have very little information or the information is, is limited because you have a lot of uh, barriers as far as uh, access to the uh, information because, of course, they, they are new and they have proprietary technologies behind it. The other important note is there is most likely going to be a lot of these 141 vaccines that uh, will fail uh, because, as you know, uh, du during biological development, there's uh, a high risk of failure at the early stages. and Hopefully, however, um, we will be able to at least get uh, a few that will transverse this uh, translational pathway towards, of course, development and licensure. Um, there also will be a need that most likely we're going to have uh, more than one vaccine that it would be suitable not only for appropriateness of uh, location maybe around the world based on, a, a, again, its manufacturability, scalability, but also because Ultimately, we will need a spectrum of vaccines that not only will be used for healthy uh, individuals, but also those that are of special consideration, such as elderly, pediatrics, pregnant women, or even immunocompromised patients. So in the next slide, I would like to provide you that uh, there are, are, there are um, two major uh, stra strategies that are being approached globally. Uh, there's the US uh, strategy, and I think a lot of you have been hearing on the news uh, the, um, the strategy called um, Operation Warp Speed. And this one now have highlighted that they have selected five vaccines, including uh, Moderna's, uh, the AstraZeneca, the um, Johnson & Johnson, the Merck vaccine, and Pfizer that are being slated. And, and sometimes it's hard to understand the language of are they speaking about um, advanced manufacturing and therefore they're, develop, they're, they're giving funding to these organizations and pharma to uh, stockpile already vaccines as the clinical trials are advancing. But also, of course, the mindfulness that, you know, before they can get deployed, you know, we need to, of course, look at their safety and efficacy. Amongst these five, which are the original, the in, initial five, there most likely will be, of course, uh, more to be added to this pool. 
Um, um, some, most of these, as you know, are experimental, as you can see. They're, they're not really proven technologies, as I mentioned. But at least, for example, the Merck vaccine is based on their ex prior experience in the Ebola. So at least we know that <clears throat> that technology um, was successful in, in the context of a pandemic. Um, there is also the NIH uh, that is aligned with the, the other governmental agencies, such as, of course, BARDA and others, that, are, um, that created a, um, a, a group of, of, of experts uh, called the active group, uh, that, that they are also very closely monitoring and supporting this goal of harmonizing and creating collaborative approaches, indeed for the design of how the clinical testings will look like for phase three, what are the issues that we're going to have to face with regards to scale up distribution. And that's where I think it's important that all of them are, of course, communicating and disseminating and, and sharing the information. In the next slide, um, I tell you that unfortunately the U.S. strategy is uh, not uh, is, is similar, but not necessarily embedded with the alignment of the uh, rest of the world strategy, which is of course led by a consortium of other organizations, including um, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates and CEPI, which is a coalition of emergency preparedness and innovation. There we have, of course, uh, major players, including the developing country vaccine manufacturing networks around the world, uh, Gavi, Wellcome Trust, and world, the World Health Organization. The intent is pretty much the same, um, uh, and they're also looking to see how they can bridge all the uh, um, activities worldwide. In the next slide, I just uh, highlight to you what we are doing, so our vaccine center uh, has uh, had a uh, um, SARS vaccine that was already quite advanced. In fact, it was already manufactured under good manufacturing practices. It does use one of these uh, technologies that are proven, recombinant protein using yeast express proteins. We are making, of course, in Texas, advancing it in the U.S. within the, this alignment of the U.S. strategy, but we're also working with the global strategy because the intent is to bring it to the global um, stage working with developing country vaccine manufacturers. In parallel, we're also advancing very rapidly the um, RBD. It's a receptor binding domain of the spike. I can go more in details if I need. And, and of course, all of this is done with partners. I'm very pleased to say that, you know, a lot of the work we've done is together with UTMB, which we have, of course, Dr. Weaver on the uh, panel and other agencies in the U.S. So I think I'm gonna um, stop there and uh, we'll take questions um, at the end of the, um, uh, the rest of the speakers. Dr. Hasseltine, you're muted. I have a bad habit of not unmuting. Um, uh, I wanna thank you, Dr. Patazzi and um, uh, Dr. Jan, um, you're up next. Hi, my name is Mamta Jan, um, and so I um, uh, have spent my career um, uh, doing clinical trials in HIV, hepatitis C, other viral illnesses, and and so um, and influenza also, um, and so um, when um, this pandemic hit our area, um, I. Uh, felt like it was my responsibility to step in and and um, provide some of the clinical trials um, expertise that were needed to get drugs to patients. Um, next slide. Um, so I want to first just kind of this is whoops if we can go back to the pr prior slide. Okay, so this is just a um, diagram of of the the. Uh, many different therapeutic targets that are being looked at for um, treatment uh, for COVID-19. Um, and, and, and I want to, uh, I'll have another slide talking about this, but right now, again, we're six months into this pandemic. We don't have novel therapeutic molecules, development of novel molecules like we have, for example, for HIV that are specific protease inhibitors or specific polymerase inhibitors, 
um, things that we have for hepatitis C took seven to 10 years to develop because they have to be specific for that virus. Um, and so all of these drugs that we are currently looking at are repurposed drugs. Um, and so, um, uh, um, and so we we you know we're trying to see if any of those may have efficacy. Um, so um, there are drugs um, that are targeting the antiviral mechanisms, such um, Kaletra, uh, hydroxychloroquine, remdesivir, um, interferons. There are drugs that are. Uh, so what happens in, in an infection? You initially have your your infection, and then you have the immune response against the infection, um, which uh, we're seeing in our in, in COVID-19 patients about seven to 10 days into illness, then they seem to have a, a rapid decline, um, often requiring higher doses of, uh, of needing to be on oxygen and maybe mechanical ventilation. And, and, and a cytokine storm sort of occurring. Um, and so, so now there are, um, um, uh, uh, studies focusing on that cytokine storm um, uh, and, and, and trying to blunt that immune response. And these include drugs like uh, tocilizumab, um, baricitinib, and, and, and sorilumab, and, we'll, we'll, and I'll talk about the, some of those. There's also um, um, emergency use of convalescent plasma. So the idea is if you've recovered, you have antibodies. Um, um, unfortunately, um, we don't have uh, great tools clinically right now to measure uh, neutralizing antibodies. And so um, we don't know that the plasma that we're giving is actually um, uh, uh, is, is neutralizing. Um, and then um, you, you're going, you've heard about the vaccine development. So those are kind of the different tools um, that are, are, are being developed. Um, next slide. Um, this is uh, what we currently have um, at UT Southwestern. Um, we initially were involved in the remdesivir trial that Gilead had um, in our two hospital systems, in our university and our, our county hospital, Parkland. Um, and um, we, we did um, give remdesivir to a lot of patients. Um, uh, and, and then um, Regeneron has a, a drug, serolumab, which is an IL-6 inhibitor. Um, again, this is uh, focusing on that pathway of the cytokine storm. Um, and, and so it's a little bit further uh, along the disease course um, and, and looking to see if we may be able to reverse um, by, um, by kind of uh, blunting that immune response. Um, this was it's an adaptive design. Um, we initially started off in a phase two where we looked at um, uh, 200, 400, and a placebo. Um, those uh, arms are now closed. Uh, it went into a phase three. Um, and what they, this, we have learned is that during the cytokine storm, these drugs get metabolized very quickly, and they've had to quickly um, um, uh, move into giving higher and higher doses. So we're now giving 800. But the, the group that seems to be benefiting, at least right now, from the preliminary data appears to be those who um, are mechanical ventilation. So, um, so that's still ongoing. It's in phase three. Um, uh, we're also participating in the HERO study. This is a study, um, um, that, uh, this is not a treatment study, it's a prevention study. So it's for healthcare workers that are kind of on the front line, your um, emergency room um, providers, EMT, uh, pulmonary critical care, um, the nursing staff um, that take care of COVID patients that maybe have high risk exposure um, and they get randomized to placebo or hydroxychloroquine. Um, I will show you some data about post-exposure prophylaxis in, uh, later, but um, uh, hydro this is going to be looking at hydroxychloroquine for 30 days versus placebo. Um, and then we are also participating in ACT-2. Now this study um, is actually, so ACT-1 um, was the study that um, looked at remdesivir versus placebo. Um, and uh, showed that there was a benefit uh, with um, giving remdesivir. Um, but now the question that is being ask, asked by this study, um, as I mentioned again, um, we see this two-phase response. We have this antiviral, and then you have this inflammatory phase. And so uh, the question is, 
would adding an anti-inflammatory, an immunomodulator, um, increase uh, efficacy or improve outcomes? And so this study is actually randomizing people to an antiviral alone, remdesivir, or an antiviral in combination with the JAK1 inhibitor or daricitinib. Um, and so we've just started enrollment in that study. And that should, um, the plan is for that study to be enrolled, fully enrolled by um, the end of June or early July. Um, next slide. Um, and, and I'm sorry, you could actually, um, well, I, I just wanted to talk about the, the clinical trials. So as I kind of mentioned, you know, we have these four phases of clinical trials and drug development. Um, if you go from a trying to make a novel molecule um, requires a lot of time. Um, and so currently all the clinical trials are really focusing on repurposed drugs um, um, because these are drugs already um, available. Um, and, and so, and, and it's now just um, uh, um, using those drugs in COVID patients and seeing if there's efficacy. Remdesivir is an antiviral, but it was developed for Ebola. Um, and, and so the efficacy um, is modest because it's not specific for uh, 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 SARS-CoV-2. I, I do want to point out some of the challenges that we've had um, trying to do clinical trials in a global pandemic. Um, these have ranged. I think one of the biggest things I've been struck by is um, the fact that when you approach a patient to participate in a clinical trial, that um, there are many people who refuse. Um, and and uh, I want a drug that works. Uh, yet we are in, a, in a, uh, a pandemic in which we don't have a drug that we know works. And so it, it fundamentally is the, the fact that people really don't understand how drug development occurs and how um, um, drugs come to market and, and, and need to be approved, that we do need the clinical trials to show efficacy and, and, um, and, 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 and actually have a drug that works. And so that, that has, it's, it's, uh, it's a hard thing to help people understand. Um, is it ethical to give a placebo? Um, and, uh, you know, I've had those questions asked. I can tell you that even some of our clinicians are like, well, I don't feel comfortable uh, recommending this trial. They may get placebo. I'm like, but it is absolutely in, uh, uh, the, the most important thing that we do when we um, uh, do a clinical trial is to have that placebo arm. We, we don't know if these drugs work. We cannot distinguish what um, side effects or safety is occurring due to the disease versus due to the drug if we do not have a placebo. Um, and, and, and because we don't know if the drug works, we can't just give it. That is not in my opinion, ethical, but it, 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 it has been a question that keeps getting raised. Um, um, and, 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 and so, um, I mean, and it's also even come up with off-label use. So for example, hydroxychloroquine is available, tocilizumab is available, and people can give it off-label. Um, should we be giving it when we don't have the data and we're not going to be able to analyze uh, whether it really works or not if you don't have them in a clinical trial. Um, if, um, and then th there's been issues with just uh, infrastructure and scale up. I mean, um, to, there are, uh, we've enrolled almost 160 plus patients in two hospitals. The amount of research coordination, everything's happening. Again, uh, I think um, the word was warp speed. Um, and, um, and so you need a, 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 an army of people to kind of be able to do this. I mean, the data needs to be entered quickly because everyone wants the answers quickly. Um, and, and so that has been a, a huge uh, resource um, uh, strain. Um, and, and then, you know, we've had, uh, I mean, our, in our county hospital, uh, it's 90% of the patients that we are seeing are Hispanic. And so there's been language barriers. I think that's also been contributing to the issues of understanding clinical trials. Uh, fortunately, we've had um, bilingual uh, uh, 
coordinators, but those have been um, uh, some of the issues. And then uh, just, um, you know, being in, you know, the, the fear factor of, um, and, and, and the lack of PPEs, it's making just trying to consent a patient very, very challenging. Um, we've had to do remote consenting and, and, and things like um, uh, DocuSigns and verifying. I mean, I'm taking pictures of pages of the, the consent form where the nurse brings it to the, to, the, um, to the door and I take a picture and have her witness that the patient did sign it. I mean, the, the, we, we're doing things that we've never done before um, um, in order to, to um, uh, kind of uh, provide um, these, um, um, these medications and, and, and access. So I, this is the, the last slide. I just wanted to just um, present some of the data um, that we have. Um, so a, we, I mentioned Kalitra early on. That uh, data shows that this does not seem to be effective. Um, if you look at the bottom here, this is, and I, I realized later that I forgot to add um, what the treatment group and control group is. So this is a study actually done in Hong Kong. And in Hong Kong, everyone, um, um, so anyway, I, I, my time is up, but uh, I'll just show you that remdesivir data showed that it was uh, effective and the hydroxychloroquine was, um, did not um, show efficacy when it was given to people five days after um, being exposed. So that's the end. Thank you. Thank you very much. There's so much to consider. Yes. Um, so Dr. Jan, thank you. And Dr. Weaver, um, is the uh, John C. Lee Distinguished Chair in Human Infections and Immunity at the University of Texas Medical Branch. Welcome. Good morning and greetings from Galveston. What I thought I would do today would be to tell you a little bit about our, our efforts, uh, mainly vaccine and drug development, also about some of our unique resources on our campus. I think that we're especially uh, well positioned to contribute to the preclinical uh, research uh, in, in drug and vaccine development. That's the animal and in vitro studies that are re typically required before clinical trials can begin. Now, some of the vaccines you've heard about that where the platforms have been used in the past to develop other vaccines like Ebola can, can often uh, pass many of the animal studies that would be required for a brand new vaccine. But for many of the new platforms being developed, uh, they require extensive animal testing. And here at UTMB, we have uh, a lot of resources to, to drive uh, preclinical basic science research on coronaviruses and translational research. First of all, we have three faculty virologists who have spent most of their careers working exclusively on coronaviruses, ranging from basic replication studies to uh, animal model development, vaccine development, to understanding how these viruses move from bats into humans. We have state-of-the-art high containment labs, including the Galveston National Lab, which is the premier academic uh, BSL-3 and BSL-4 facility in the United States. We have a BSL-3 cryoelectron microscopy facility, the only one in the country, where we're uh, actively pursuing high-resolution imaging of the SARS coronavirus 2 to better understand the protein confirmations, and that can be used for both vaccine and antiviral development. And our uh, animal biosafety level three labs have a lot of capabilities not found at most academic institutions. For example, we have CT scanning, uh, very sophisticated blood chemistry and blood cell instrumentation, X-ray uh, whole animal plethysmography, which is important for measuring lung function in small animals, and then a system called in vivo imaging that I'll tell you more about in a moment. Uh, next slide, please. We also have the World Reference Center for Emerging Viruses and Arboviruses. Of all of our uh, uh, responses to the COVID uh, emergency, this was probably the first uh, most important early response in that we were one of the first five labs in the US to receive the virus isolate. We distributed viral RNA for, uh, for diagnostic developers all over the world, as well as virus isolates for researchers. Now we're developing viral antigens and mouse anti-sera, but we also have uh, 8,000 other emerging viruses uh, in our collection here that can be provided to uh, qualified investigators around the country. Next slide, please. 
So we wanted to focus also early on on some critical tools needed, again, for mainly for preclinical uh, development stages of vaccines and drugs. And the first was a, the ability to genetically manipulate the SARS coronavirus 2 genome. And this was developed very quickly in a, in a collaboration on our campus, a cDNA clone system, in other words, a DNA copy of the viral genome was cloned into plasmids, uh, developed into a system where transcribed RNA can be electroporated into cells and we can rescue virus with an RNA genome identical to that clone. We can also put reporter genes into that clone, for example, luciferase or green fluorescent protein that allow us to do very high throughput uh, drug screening uh, instead of by measuring reductions in virus titers produced by cell cultures, we can simply quantify the amount of, of protein expression colorimetrically and use that as a very reliable surrogate for antiviral activity. And this allows us to accelerate uh, testing of, of drug, individual drugs or libraries by an order of about 10. We also can put luciferase in the virus and that allows us to track its replication and spread in both cell cultures and animals using a system called in vivo imaging for small animals like mice where we can measure the amount of virus spread and its location in the body of a mouse over and over again without having to sacrifice animals each day. So these, uh, these tools developed through this cDNA system are, are really gonna accelerate our ability to test drugs and vaccines in animals. The other important resource we have here is a transgenic mouse model developed uh, several years back for the first SARS coronavirus these are mice that express the human receptor for both SARS-1 and SARS-2. ACE2 is called the, the protein. And these animals, unfortunately, were, were sitting in the form of uh, embryos in a liquid nitrogen tank when the pandemic began earlier this year because there really wasn't much interest in SARS uh, after the uh, 2003 outbreak ended. So these have been uh, gearing up to breed at very high capacity through a commercial company in the US and we have every reason to believe they're gonna be very useful, in some cases, lethal models for SARS-2 infection. That'll be very important for testing the efficacy of drugs and vaccines after the initial in vitro studies. And they should be available later this month or in July for use throughout the country. Next slide, please. So in addition to that ACE transgenic mouse model, we've been developing a number of other important animal models. Uh, First of all, we've developed a mouse adapted strain of the, the SARS coronavirus using that CNA, cDNA clone system. So this is a, a mutant of the virus that replicates very efficiently in any mouse strain. They don't have to be transgenic. And this will give us a second very important tool for the initial animal testing of drugs and vaccines. We've also done experiments with hamsters, which are very useful and ferrets which are especially good models for transmission from animal to animal and determining, for example, whether a vaccine not only protects against disease or a drug, but whether it prevents transmission from person to person. And then generally non-human primates are the gold standards required for uh, the FDA to approve a clinical trial. We've been working with three different species, rhesus and cinemalgus macaques and African green monkeys and they are also very useful, although they don't produce severe disease even in older age groups. Uh, and then we have some human lung organoid uh, artificial models for use as well. Next slide, please. So we have a lot of different vaccines that we're testing in collaboration with companies that have developed them using various platforms. I won't go through all these in detail. Most of our own development has focused on live attenuated vaccines because as we know historically from rubella, measles, mumps, yellow fever, these are the vaccines that usually give the longest lived immunity and ultimately may prove to be the most useful for, uh, for COVID as well. But they take longer to develop because the safety bar is much higher for a live replicating uh, kind of vaccine platform. And then the final slide, um, we've been also developing but primarily testing uh, repurposed drugs from, from a variety of companies and developers uh, using cell culture models initially and then 
also using these animal models. We've also been testing immune plasma and monoclonal antibodies, uh, some medicinal uh, products derived from plants, and uh, some products that derive from other studies here on campus on other respiratory viruses that have proved very effective in preclinical work. So thank you very much, and I'll be glad to take questions at the end of the uh, presentations. Well, thank you, thank you very much, um, Dr. Weaver. Now, um, there have been questions that have been submitted. Some were submitted online and some were submitted um, uh, prior to starting it. I think some of the questions that were asked uh, and submitted earlier have been partially answered. But we have some interesting questions as well that have come in over line. I am particularly interested in the uh, distribution of the severity of the disease, and particularly uh, with respect to men getting it worse than women. Uh, and I don't know how that data is holding up in different environments. And secondly, the aging population. So one of the first questions that has come to us um, from someone who uh, is uh, Dr. Alving um, that has addressed it, uh, specifically the age-related question, because I think all the vaccines are gonna have to protect people of different um, susceptibilities. Um, is His comment is and question is the shing shingles vaccine with the recombinant protein antigen and powerful an uh, adjuvant uh, was reported to be 98% effective for individuals over 70. In contrast, Zizovavax uh, shingles vaccine with live attenuated strains of the zoster uh, virus as an antigen, but no adjuvant, was reported to be only 38% uh, effective for preventing shingles in those over 70s. What are the role, if any, of vaccine adjuvants for development of vaccines to SARS COVID-2. Now I'm going to address this question um, to D Dr. Bodizzi because uh, you had adjuvant on your first slide, as I remember. Yes, certainly. <clears throat> so you're absolutely right. Um, of course, a vaccine is a vaccine based on, of course, what the uh, active principles and the test articles that you include. And adjuvants, of course, uh, 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 most of the times are also big players, especially in uh, recombinant protein or subunit vaccines. Uh, so you're absolutely right. We have to be cautious and uh, certainly uh, uh, concerned of within the formulation, what are the adjuvants that are being, of course, uh, evaluated. And as Dr. Of course, Weaver said, you, know, uh, we, you first evaluate them very well in preclinical uh, assessments before you decide which ones to move forward in the clinic. Um, some of them, again, you're right, some of them are, of course, available and already uh, have wide ex experience uh, because they're licensed adjuvants. Uh, some most newest adjuvants will also, unfortunately, have to not only be evaluated in the context of COVID-2, but then, of course, have to be licensed uh, alongside with uh, such a vaccine. Uh, our strategy, for example, is also trying to um, look for the adjuvants that are, have the least regulatory burdens in their path towards development. For example, we use um, aluminum, which is, of course, a, a, um, an adjuvant that is already uh, used widely in other vaccines. Uh, um, uh, um, but there are, for example, news that for uh, GSK, for example, is making their adjuvants available for evaluation. So certainly when you look at not only the design of the vaccine candidate, um, the evidence of uh, protection and safety, uh, certainly adjuvants are included in that um, as well. And that will eventually, indeed, you're right, you know, uh, formulations and the types of uh, formulations that are going to be used for certain target populations may not be the same formulations that you use for other types of formulations, such as the example you're giving with regards to the two uh, shingles uh, vaccines. Do any of you, others of you have comments? The panelists, please. Yeah, if I can make one other comment. Um, I think that adjuvants may prove to be especially important for COVID vaccines because work done on SARS-1, the original SARS virus uh, vaccine development, showed that if the type of immune response uh, 
if it's skewed towards Th1 versus Th2, different kinds of immune responses that have different kinds of efficacy against viruses versus parasites, for example. If the, the immune response is skewed in the wrong direction, with, which for viruses is typically Th2, there can, that can actually promote inflammation if an animal after vaccination is exposed to the virus and could exacerbate disease. So we're gonna to have to be very careful evaluating these immune responses in the phase two clinical trials and make sure we don't produce a vaccine that could result in more severe disease in some people. Dr. Jan, did you want to comment as well? I, I, I agree with the, the panelists. I don't think I have anything else to add. Okay, well, the, uh, a question that uh, is somewhat directed to you that came in, um, that they wanted to, uh, Dr. Mattis uh, wanted to know um, if there are different strains of COVID had been identified and what does that mean for immunity and vaccines? Are only one, are you, if you're immune to one strain, would that uh, cover others? And uh, would you still need a vaccination? And you're doing some clinical trials uh, at the moment, so I was wondering what you thought about it. Are you referring to me? Um, yeah. okay. it, so in terms of uh, clinical trials, I mean, uh, I think in terms of having the disease, it's probably gonna be the same. Um, the the different strains, I, 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 um, I, I this sounds like it, you know this may be like influenza where you there's a genetic um, a, a drift and 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 so if that were the case then um, we may be in a, a situation where you need to have um, a, a, a a vaccine for each strain but I think this also depends on um, whether um, um, uh, the, uh, how long the immunity with these vaccines last, uh, uh, and I, I just don't think we know the answer to that yet. But I, I think uh, um, some of the other panelists may be able to answer that. I think, again, drawing from uh, work done on SARS uh, coronavirus 1 many years ago, we suspect that immunity the SARS coronavirus 2 may not be very long lived even following natural infection. So I think there's a very strong chance that we're going to have to have uh, vaccines that can be boosted uh, every few years. And I think it's too early to know whether uh, this SARS coronavirus will have the ability to mutate as rapidly as influenza viruses do. Uh, a lot of the reason we require a flu shot every year is because uh, the virus mutates very rapidly in key epitopes that are the targets of our antibody response. And uh, it's going to take uh, simply following the, the sequences of human strains as the outbreak continues. It's going to take a little bit longer before we know how quickly the SARS coronavirus is able to do that kind of mutation that would allow it to overcome either natural or vaccine-derived immunity. I think if I can just add another comment, and I think one of the reasons why we made the decision that we wanted to also evaluate um, a SARS uh, recombinant protein vaccine uh, in context of protecting against SARS-2, it's indeed to also establish, you know, how valuable would it be to uh, eventually be able to use uh, uh, a vaccine that may have been developed for uh, uh, similar, but of course not necessarily identical coronaviruses, and the and the, the the ability of eventually, as you know, it would be ideal that we would go towards developing vaccines that could be considered universal, or that eventually we don't have to stop and start from scratch every time we have, hopefully not, a new uh, coronavirus uh, virus. So I think it's important to understand also uh, how can we um, evaluate the um, uh, efficacy of different types of vaccines in the context of this virus. Sort of a follow-up to that um, question is, in the immune serums that are supposed immune serums from people who've recovered, how is that data looking? Dr. Jan, you've been... Um... Well, um, 
you know, so we have been um, collecting serum on on patients who have recovered, um, and um, and looking at uh, and giving um, plasma uh, to patients. I, 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 you know, um, I wish I could say that you know um, all of these patients recovered with giving that. It, you know, they don't. Um, I think um, there's still um, still things that we need to learn again. You know, we need to know, it, we have to be able to measure uh, neutralizing antibodies and to know that people are making neutralizing antibodies. Uh, you know, I think we definitely see ver a variation in disease, right? There are people who have very mild disease that never come to the hospital. And then those who are very exuberant disease that are hospitalized, do those who have a much more exuberant disease and recover, are those the ones that really have neutralizing antibodies? And the ones that have mild, um, they don't. And um, even though they form IgGs, are those, are, are those patients with they, you know, does that, um, if you get plasma from those patients, will it be protective for the next person? I, 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 don't, I don't think we have that data yet. Okay. Um, we have a question from Louis Duplice, um, and this is to Dr. Um, what is it? I'm still not properly <laughs> pronouncing your name. <laughs> totally fine. Don't worry. Um, does Baylor College of Medicine and Texas Children's know which biopharma companies they will use to manufacture their vaccines? And where does uh, BCM stand on their clinical trials? Uh, sure. So we indeed, like as I mentioned in my presentation, we are working very much aligned with the what we call developing country vaccine manufacturers. I cannot announce you the exact name, but probably next week we will announce uh, an agreement we have with one of these uh, large uh, vaccine manufacturers. Uh, in the U.S., currently we're working with Walter Reed. As you know, Walter Reed does have pilot manufacturing facilities. They've been producing our vaccines for uh, all our neglected diseases for a long time, as well as other institutions uh, locally. But the intent is most likely, again, to look for a network because as we heard, we probably will need um, millions and millions of doses if our vaccine works. And we need to already know who has the capability uh, uh, all over the world. Fortunately, again, it's a vaccine uh, that is well known how to make it using yeast protein-based vaccines. It's the same process as the hepatitis B vaccine. So anybody who can make that vaccine uh, is suitable for this vaccine as, as far as uh, uh, we, we understand. And, and where we're standing with clinical trials, the, um, uh, the um, FDA should be responding actually probably between tomorrow and Monday to our uh, regulatory package. Uh, based on the timeline, and we would expect to be in the clinic uh, after the summer, probably uh, the first, uh, in September, um, so that we can uh, get into evaluating the safe, uh, the safety and efficacy, and get some proof of concept of neutralizing antibodies in in, in the cohort of individuals. This is a, a question that came in that uh, probably uh, can be addressed to any of you who want to pick it up uh, initially. What types of antibodies, IgG or IgM, are picked up in the serological testing and, of course, which are protective? Uh, so, uh, you know, um, I, I think there is a lot of different types of tests that are available. Um, uh, so they, they can test for IgM and IgG. The IgM is just an acute uh, so you see that early in infection. In fact, um, some uh, data I've seen people are, have been using IgM in conjunction with a, 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 a nasal swab or a PCR test, and, and have found that to be more um, able to uh, diagnose for diagnostic purposes. But um, the IgG is what you expect after you have kind of recovered. Um, and, you know, I think there is some data uh, coming that those that IgG may be protective. Um, I, I personally right now think of IgG uh, representing that you've been exposed. Um, I, I just don't know right now clinically if I um, can say, you know, believe that those who have IgG are completely protected from getting infected. Okay. Uh, Scott, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I think the more important distinction that we need to make, and we're not quite there yet, is 
to distinguish between neutralizing and non-neutralizing antibodies. Whenever we respond to a viral infection, we produce lots of different antibodies that target different proteins and different uh, amino acids on those proteins. Some of those can block infection of cells and replication. Those are neutralizing antibodies. Others are not neutralizing. Usually neutralizing antibodies are, are the most predictive of protection. And, uh, but the, new, the test to determine neutralizing antibody tires in people is much harder to develop. And so that uh, cDNA reverse genetic system that I showed you is being developed very rapidly with a commercial partner now to develop a, a high throughput, very rapid neutralization assay that we hope will be available in, in hospital clinics maybe in six to 12 months. And I think once we reach the point where we can test people's neutralizing antibody titers uh, after infection or after vaccination, then we'll be in a position to predict much better whether they're truly protected or not. That seems to be a requirement for knowing whether or not your vaccines you're developing uh, have efficacy. Right. For, for vaccine uh, testing, preclinical and clinical, we can do traditional neutralization tests. They're slower and they take longer, but for a limited number of people, it's feasible to do that. But to, to move this into the diagnostic arena in hospitals and clinics, it has to be uh, made much, much faster and high throughput. Well, then, uh, Dr. Mehta, um, asks, uh, what are the major stumbling blocks and time frame in terms of developing for COVID-19? And since you started with this, uh, this question, I'll basically uh, ask you to continue. Scott. I'm sorry, can you please repeat yeah, that? Yeah, it was, because uh, you're discussing some of the challenges and one of the questions was, what are the major stumbling blocks technologically yep. and time frame in developing the vaccine for COVID-19? Okay. Well, I think, you know, the technology has really uh, increased at an incredible rate um, since, especially since Ebola and Zika, to where this, this year we had vaccines in clinical trials within two or three months of recognition of the pandemic. Uh, so a lot of these platforms can be turned around. They're more or less plug and play platforms. You take the same viral vector or the same RNA expression system and you just put a different sequence in it. So that could be done even before we had the virus here in the US and it was. I think it, the challenges are um, uh, you still have to be very careful with the clinical trials and especially if there's a possibility that the wrong kind of immune response could lead to a worse disease outcome. We learned this the hard way a long time ago with a vaccine for respiratory syncytial virus. It was an inactivated vaccine that triggered the wrong kind of immune response and uh, children actually got much sicker who were vaccinated than children who were not vaccinated. So we have to, we, we know a lot more about the immunology now. I think we we're in a good position to predict what kind of immune response we need, but we need to proceed very carefully and uh, so that we don't do harm with a vaccine that's uh, triggering the wrong response. Okay, we have basically time for um, one last uh, question. And what I would like to do is pose something that um, is more of a overall uh, question. And that is uh, the technologies that we're using that as uh, Dr. Weaver just described that we're able to be quickly ramped up for this um, pandemic uh, because they had been you they had been developed for other uh, inf infections or what looked like potential pandemics like for SARS and MERS but didn't end up having enough patients to in the end to tr to even see if they were vaccines would work do you think that some of these technologies now that we're going to have them in <coughs> many vaccines that'll probably have to be produced do you think that this will help us deal with some of the future things that are going to come along and even some things that are common that we've just never really tackled like uh, other coronaviruses, our favorite one we catch when we take airplanes, common cold or our children bring home. So uh, Dr. Bodizzi, do you want to start with that? And Well, certainly. I think, uh, uh, I hope that uh, even though it's in context of being such a crisis and 
and uh, clearly uh, that we're doing uh, things at just an unprecedented, uh, not only speed, but uh, keeping in check that balance of risk and the benefit of doing things too quickly and to uh, without you know keep taking the time to review the data correctly. I think it's it, it's going to set a precedent uh, a precedent of how we can be more innovative in the designs of how we uh, not only design the preclinical but certainly also how the clinical uh, studies are being designed. Uh, how we can um, accelerate uh, at some level. The evaluation, uh, um, especially those that are, like Dr. Weaver were saying, very critical to ensure that we don't eventually lead to uh, a worst uh, um, case uh, uh, when we use the vaccines. I think one aspect is also that it has um, reinvigorated the, the, the need of really understanding a better uh, research model of where uh, we, we can't just uh, do research when there's a crisis. We have to continuously do research uh, sustainably uh, uh, such that we can therefore have a lot of these basic uh, understandings of the pathology, immunology, uh, virology uh, of these uh, pathogens that can certainly prepare us in the future. Uh, so I think that you know the value of science and the value of education, and maybe I'll end with Let's not forget that we've also maybe learned the, the, a little bit the hard way that we have to also maybe improve the culture of communication of how we really communicate uh, not only the scientific findings, but ensure that there's a, a better way that we can um, not get uh, um, certainly lost in such uh, so many uh, media and so much information and how can we ensure that the people really uh, um, uh, you know, really get the message, which is the real message and the important message, rather than basically getting lost in a lot of the uh, uh, over-dramatized and maybe exaggerated uh, information. Thank you. Dr. Weaver? I, I agree with Dr. Batazzi. I, I want to give one example of how I think this may improve our vaccine development going forward. So many of the diseases that we don't have effective vaccines against our emerging diseases. They occur very sporadically and unpredictably. So we have a situation like uh, four, four or five years ago when Zika virus arrived. Um, again, the, the vaccines were developed very, very quickly. Uh, they were into clinical trials quickly, but the, uh, the regulatory pathway took so long that by the time uh, companies were, were ready to begin the final phases of clinical trials, the outbreak was over. And uh, when we don't have good surveillance, there's still plenty of Zika virus circulating in the Americas and Asia and Africa. But when we don't do surveillance, we don't know where people are being exposed. So right now, it would be almost impossible to know whether a Zika virus was effective or not because we wouldn't know where to go to test it in people who are gonna be exposed to the virus. So I think the faster that we can streamline not only the vaccine development, but also the, the regulatory pathway, that, that uh, the next time uh, a sporadically emerging disease comes along, maybe we'll be able to do the efficacy trials during the outbreak instead of uh, waiting until it's, it's over. And during an outbreak is the best time to do these trials because when there's a lot of human exposure, you can vaccinate and sham vaccinate small numbers of people and get your data much faster and much less expensively. And of course, uh, cost is one of the main considerations for companies investing in vaccine development. It typically costs hundreds of millions of dollars for a new vaccine. So I, I'm optimistic that COVID will help us with other emerging viruses to come. Thank you. So this uh, basically concludes it. I'd like to thank the speakers and the attendees and their questions. And now I'm gonna turn it back over to uh, Terrence Henry. Thanks, Dr. Hasseltine. And thank you, Drs. Batazzi and Jan and Dr. Weaver for your time today and for sharing your science with us. Uh, just a few final items before we say goodbye today. Uh, we are happy to announce our next session, which will be two weeks from today in this series uh, at the same time. And uh, we're gonna look at the cross section of uh, medicine and engineering uh, and some success stories and innovations and ingenuity that have happened 
uh, very rapidly in the space uh, of personal protective equipment. Um, so we're going to look at some uh, success stories of uh, new ways of manufacturing and sterilizing uh, that PPE. And uh, we're very happy that Adam Hamilton, the president and CEO of Southwest Research Institute in San Antonio, will be moderating that session. And we have Brian Alsip from the University Health System in San Antonio and Imad Kalik from Southwest Research Institute confirmed to speak. And we're working on an additional speaker for that session that we're hoping to announce soon. Uh, you will receive an invite to that session in a follow-up email tomorrow. Also in that email, we'll have a link to the video of recording of this session. And we'll also have links to the slide presentations from the three speakers today. Uh, and would encourage you that if uh, we didn't have a chance to get to your question today, uh, you can take a look at those slides and then perhaps uh, reach out to the speakers if that's helpful to you. Uh, we're planning some future sessions throughout the rest of the summer and the fall in this series. Uh, some other topics that we're going to be addressing include health dis disparities uh, and the disparate impacts of COVID-19. Uh, we're going to have a session dedicated to what it's like to survive and recover from COVID-19. And then we're also developing a session that's going to look at the impacts on higher education uh, universities and institutions in Texas. Uh, we're also going to have a, a survey that you'll see right at the end of the session as we conclude. If you have a couple minutes to provide your feedback and any thoughts or ideas you have on what you'd like to hear about in future sessions, we'd love to have uh, that feedback from you. Thank you again for joining us and thanks to our moderator and speakers. And we hope everyone uh, is well and has a good day. Thank you again.